Today I'm going to talk a little bit about log analysis tool that I've been developing or pretty much the community has been developing, it's not only me anymore. And uh, I will mention a couple things, especially uh, what has, have, has changed in it uh, between the seasons as there have been some changes and also I will share some links to resources on uh, to, to get to know better uh, more of it if we get some time towards the end and I hope we do then I'm gonna show a bit of vlog analysis uh, with vlogs from my training today morning um, yeah so uh, let me just uh, change focus okay uh, right so Let's start with uh, a little bit about me. So, yeah, I'm a senior uh, software engineer or pretty much pr uh, transitioning to lead developer right now, uh, mainly working in Java. Uh, I work for Open Market. Uh, it's a company that provides messages and solutions for other companies that uh, want to communicate with their customers at scale. Um, I'm also an AWS machine learning hero. Um, I'm a, one of the uh, community leaders uh, within the AWS Depressor community. Uh, I've been to the finals in 2019 and uh, hopefully I'll get to the finals in 2020 as well. And uh, my hopes are pretty up, uh, pretty high right now because uh, I'm currently third in the object avoidance race uh, in April. Uh, so if I manage to hold on to it, uh, yeah, we'll meet in Vegas if you go there. Uh, and yeah, I'm a, ho a hobbyist baker, so you can see me here with some Borodinsky bread that I baked a couple years ago. And I like blogging, so uh, it pretty much started with bread centric. Uh, which is my bread baking blog and then I had a couple other minor things and uh, right now I'm pretty much mainly focusing on the community blog blog deep racing IO uh, but yeah let's move on to the log analysis so uh, how it all began how my story with deep racer began really uh, I was sent to uh, to reinvent in 2018 when Deep Racer was announced and uh, when I heard about it I said like oh that's cool I'm not gonna go to the workshops to get one of those because uh, I would just waste it and then I thought like what if I could actually use it if if I could just uh, if I could just use it to spark curiosity in some people at, uh, especially the kids you know I kind of like showing things and getting this ah and this like oh I want to learn well so I thought could I actually use this somehow uh, so yeah I just woke up at five had a breakfast at six sat in the queue uh, for one of the workshops managed to get in I got the car and then I came back to London with the car and nothing happened because I couldn't really train it, the console was not available, I didn't have a track to uh, run the car on, but I knew there would be a season and uh, when I learned there will be there, there would be race in London at the summit, I said okay I'm not gonna waste this, I'm gonna just train uh, for the race, I'm gonna go over there, I'm gonna bring my model, get a lap around the track, at least that, just, just something, I'm gonna try. Uh, and yeah, I started with, uh, I tried to train with uh, the sample notebooks, which didn't work for me because I didn't know how to use the notebooks then. And uh, and uh, then the at the end, in the end of April 2019, when the console became available, it was pretty much a week before uh, the summit in London. I just uh, said, okay, this is my chance. I, I spun up my training I had roughly $200 credits from all the workshops at reInvent and said, okay, this is my budget. Uh, 
And yeah, just started trading. Uh, I think I was able to do roughly 15 seconds ar uh, around the track, and uh, and yeah, I was pretty happy with this. But but I've seen Rick's finals in 2018, and I remember this magic going under one minute around the la and around the track, right? So I thought. If I manage to go under 40 seconds, it will be a success and I will be happy. And, uh, and yeah, it worked pretty well over there. But I also, I, I went to the workshops over there. So the screen that you see over here is uh, from the Deep Racer TV that was recorded in London at the workshops. Um, I went over there because I said, okay, like more credits, more racing should be fun. Uh, but when I sat over there during the session, I had this aha moment when I actually managed to run something in a Jupyter notebook. Remember, I'm just uh, Java all the way down. <laughs> I, I, I use some Python. I never used Jupyter notebook before. And when I learned that, hey, you can just actually run code in this. This is cool. I said, okay, so I knew that the log analysis thing that was sh shared with the uh, workshop actually made sense uh, now. It, it, it just clicked for me. Uh, and yeah, I, I knew this and uh, and pretty much left it at the, uh, when the season started, I just uh, kept running and training and training. I said, okay, if my car is not doing well, um, then probably it's just not enough training. I'm gonna train a couple of hours more. Uh, I didn't change pretty much anything. I just trained more and more and I could not see any progress. I did not, did not know why. I finally, uh, I think in the first race in the virtual, in the virtual league, I finished 20th and I thought uh, towards the end, I had really good time, but I couldn't repeat it and I didn't know why. And then I remembered that there was the log analysis folder that, uh, that uh, was shared by uh, that was shared by AWS. Uh, I ran, I spun it up, I ran some analysis over there and I realized that my model wasn't really good at all. I had just a lucky shot once that had good times. But yeah, you know, you've been training a little bit already or maybe a lot. So many of you know that it's pretty much fun to just stare at the car going around the track but it g doesn't give us much information and that's why uh, the log analysis makes sense because uh, if the car goes around the track lines like this get recorded which inform you about each step that the car makes um, then this you can load to the notebook and visualize the progress and certain behaviors, find out if the, if you're actually progressing, if not, if the behavior is changing in any way. And, uh, and yeah, I struggled, so I started l using this. Then uh, it felt that w there was a lot of, uh, to me, that it was a lot of code, so I moved some code aside. Then I said, okay, it's not enough charts, so I added some more. I started plotting new things. Then something was failing. Uh, it turned out that there were some memory leaks, so I fixed those. Then uh, something was in insanely slow. I found out that I could do things faster. I've added them. And that's how the community log analysis tool was born. Uh, a little bit on what's really in the log analysis. So Jupyter Notebook. Uh, are you familiar, guys, with the Jupyter Notebook? Uh, Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we are. Okay. Or at least I am. Yeah. So for me, it was a new thing then, really. But uh, now I made really close friends with it. Then it also uses the uh, AWS uh, Python uh, API to just download the logs mainly, uh, at least the older version. The newer version has a bit more. Uh, there's NumPy, Pandas, and Matplotlib just pretty much for faster calculations and uh, computations and uh, for managing the uh, time series data and visualizing it. Pretty handy thing and, uh, and uh, enjoyable to work with. I won't be showing more about what's in the notebook. Instead, I'm going to paste a link in the, uh, in the chat uh, with the initial uh, log analysis tool and with a talk from reInvent where I presented 
what I pay attention to when I analyze the logs. Um, let me find where the chart is. It's all the way at the top. You have to hover over. Yeah, yeah, I found it. Uh, okay, cool. So yeah, these are the two links. Uh, uh, right, so going back to the uh, presentation, to the slides. Uh, so yeah, it, it grew pretty nicely. And uh, just, just remember, I am a Java dev and I'm actually quite deeply legacy Java dev. So I have not used cloud before. Depressor was my first service in AWS that I've actually used. And uh, everything was pretty new. Uh, I have never made a project that other, others used. So this was also new for me. Quite a lot of things that I've learned over there where actually people paid attention to what I've done and, uh, and used it and I had some feedback. So interesting thing. It grew and people used it and started learning more and more about uh, the racing. Uh, and quite a nice moment with this was the community log analysis challenge that we've run uh, in October. And the, the challenge was just prepare some improvement to, uh, to the notebooks. And uh, there was a guide how to set up a pull request and uh, and just general encouragement i was supporting everyone who was asking questions giving s out some ideas and uh, uh, it was pretty nice uh, many of the people uh, who took part it was their first pull request in their lives some of them had to register to github because before they had no need to actually do anything over there so this was quite interesting uh, I remember one of the entrance uh, comp uh, competitors. They he asked me for some ideas because said, like I, I've got no ideas and whatever I gave him, he was asking me like 15 minutes later. Okay, done. What next? And then I, I pretty much lost most of my ideas in one evening. Uh, and yeah, it was really fun. So f these are some images from what pe what people have shared. Uh, this one just shows some perfect line around the track that gets uh, calculated the other one here uh, one of the uh, one of the racers from new york actually uh, chris thompson he prepared analysis on where the car leaves the track where it crashes so uh, this is also quite an interesting thing to look at uh, yeah but i haven't merged any of them and uh, obviously y we can we can say that this was because I'm just a lazy guy, but uh, the reality is a bit more complex. So, uh, do you remember front page for editing websites? Um, Jupyter Notebook is really uh, nice to work in with. It's visually pleasing, but if you look at version control for JSON that's being generated by it, it's a nightmare. Uh, so I had those 10 pull requests. Uh, they were not compatible with any changes that I made in the meantime. And I had some, like I made one fix and this mean, meant that pretty much all images got regenerated uh, and images are being stored as uh, base 64, I believe in the JSON over there. So it, it's, uh, it was a total mess in there and I couldn't, uh, I could just copy and paste things, but it felt wrong. I, I thought that but it, it, it's wrong. Something needs to be re, uh, rethought over there. Some changes overlapped, but also there was this bag of uh, supporting code where I just had three files in Python that had all the code in there. Everyone was just like, you know, let's hide everything aside uh, without any structure, without any classes or objects, without any testing or anything. It's just there and it's going to be used, but the notebook will look pretty. And uh, yeah, the other issues. So uh, I've mentioned that uh, we started with the AWS uh, prepared log analysis as a base. And uh, I forked that repo repository. I didn't want to apply my changes on master because I wanted master to be a clean copy of the uh, original repository. So I had my own branch. So what you had to do is was find the right repository, check out the branch, and then 
the notebooks that I've prepared were different from the one that AWS have prepared. I left it aside because I thought it was valuable to have it over there and to see it. Uh, people usually, the, the main issue and main struggle was to actually open the right notebook because uh, many people did not know, like, change a branch, what does it mean? And they, they, didn't, they never thought really about this. So the experience of getting started with the log analysis for someone who isn't a geek that already has some experience, uh, or maybe not a geek, but just has some experience how to work with Git and repositories and everything, it was just horrible. So uh, yeah, we just had to do better. And uh, yeah, we, we just cannot deter people when uh, when they just get started get, are getting started. So maybe we could do something that's much easier. Um, then, if we could just version the uh, the notebooks uh, in any way, but like for instance, if you had a notebook as a Python script, that could be just a file that is easy to uh, diff and see what's changed. This would be quite handy. And uh, yeah, I thought maybe we should have a utils project, which would not only have the supporting code, which was previously just unstructured, but it would have tests, it would have other packages, let's say for backing up and restoring uh, models, if you want to clean up your S3, or maybe for uploading models trained locally. There's a number of things that could go over there. So maybe we should just have a place like that uh, so yeah, that's what I decided to address this year. I started by moving the code, uh, moving the notebooks to a separate repository, which is not forked anymore. So uh, that's how Depressor Analysis was born. I'm going to just post the link in the chat. Um, actually, I'm going to post more now. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, uh, I decided to create a new repository and not to include the original notebook, not because it's bad, but because it, uh, it had the old ways of doing things and uh, methods were not bundled together in a way that was uh, intuitive for me and uh, it was missing a bit of description that I felt should have been added and adding it would make it horrible to maintain <laughs> so I decided to just leave it behind and only use the the notebooks that we've prepared in the community and uh, also I wanted it to start up easier so that's why docker image uh, you can still just uh, use the requirements file to install all the dependencies and start it up locally. But if you don't feel like cluttering uh, or uh, pr preparing a VN f on your computer and having it somewhere aside, but uh, having an image would be handier for you. If you just work with Docker most of the time, then you just build it and use it. Uh, and you don't need to think about all the configuration that's required to actually make it work. And yeah, the behavior itself is uh, pretty much same as uh, presented at the uh, at the bootcamp. Uh, that uh, the, the at the boot at reInvent there was this bootcamp conference where we talked about Depressor, and uh, one of the things that uh, I've uh, talked about was log analysis talk. So I've already shared the video link in the Zoom uh, chat and uh, you can watch more details about what's in there and if we have time maybe we'll also have a look at some log analysis towards the end uh, so yeah that got prepared now what about the versioning uh, one of the things that uh, i include in the collateral learning of doing the log analysis is that i got to talk to more people that wanted to connect with me and uh, because of that even though I don't use the, uh, the tools actively I get some information from people that the tools are there and that's how I learned about Jupytex just someone shared a post with me. So Jupytex is an extension that you just apply to your uh, Jupyter notebook which uh, uh, 
in parallel to your notebook, you are able to generate a script in Python, which is just a file with all of the uh, pretty tags being comments and all the code blocks being uh, all the code blocks being um, just just code in the in this in this file. This is quite handy because this makes the uh, comparing of changes way easier. You don't have the uh, structure that JSON has. You lose the outputs in there, obviously, but this is more of a uh, maintenance uh, version of it, and you can restore it to Jupyter uh, to Jupyter Notebook or just keep them in sync all the time. I'm going to show an example on what you can run to actually uh, restore or keep them in sync or just uh, prepare all the outputs app and have a viewable uh, have a viewable notebook to to read later on. And yeah, uh, the uh, Python uh, library, the Depressor utils. Uh, so the code that I moved aside I decided to do it the right way. You know, like I use Python for scripts like, you know, starting things up, shutting them down, uh, doing some batch things, the usual dev stuff, getting things done, not necessarily in a pretty organized way, but just getting them there. I've never actually prepared a package that could be deployed to PyPy uh, or uploaded to PyPy and others could download and use. So uh, yeah, I decided to do this. I had to learn the setup tools. I've added version here, which is, uh, which is, uh, it it's using the way of versioning in Python packages that I really love. Uh, in Java, I moved from Maven to uh, Gradle, not because I like Gradle more. I hate both of them, but uh, in Gradle uh, there is this uh, plugin called Axion plugin, which uh, which lets you re version and release new versions just by putting a tag on the code, uh, which means that all the code, the run uh, runnable code, is just in master, and whatever I want to just package it with a version, I put a tag, and it just releases it. Version you does that for se uh, with setup tools, which is really handy, and yeah, it just resonates with me. And yeah, talks so. Uh, the, the interesting thing about learning uh, how to package things is that uh, Python has this website called packagingpython.org which has a set of tutorials. This is quite handy to get started. The moment you enter the first tutorial it says we're going to use setup tools. If you want to use it right go to this other tutorial which has more up-to-date stuff. So I went to setup tools and then it said it led me through. Okay, unit tests. Is that don't use unit tests, just use talks and things like that. It kind of led me through the whole process. I managed to package it all. And uh, and yeah, old thing that was left, uh, the only thing that was left was just upload things to PyPy. And uh, yeah, I'm right now an, an owner of a package in PyPy, which is also quite an interesting new experience. So when it comes to running, I wanted it to be as simple as possible. And because of that, uh, well, it's all in the readme, but I just wanted to show you why uh, I think it's uh, why I'm happy with all what I've done, really. Uh, so I've prepared a set of scripts. For now, you need to build the Docker image yourself. But uh, when I was preparing for this talk, I realized I, w I didn't have the recent version of uh, the tool on this laptop that I'm using right now. It took me five minutes to download uh, all the images. Most of it was just ju downloading the Jupyter Notebook one and then build, installing all the dependencies and getting it running. Then I just ran the start script, uh, got the URL to the notebook, opened it in the browser and it just worked. Uh, if you don't want to do this, if you want to have like more uh, local on your computer environment, you can just use uh, VN to activate uh, activate it, install the dependencies and also run JupyterLab. Both of them work. I pretty much prepare Docker because everything's set up in it. Uh, hopefully at some point I'll be also hosting the Docker images so that you just download, download it and run it locally. And uh, the outcome of it is also quite nice in terms of editing as I've mentioned. So the notebooks that are over there are already configured to be in sync using Jupytex. Every time you edit the notebook, the Python file gets edited with it. 
and then what it means that uh, once you finish your work you just push it to a branch you merge you issue a pull request and what i will do then is i will just compare the python files i will ignore the uh, notebook because if it makes sense in the python files i will just merge it and then just run the other co uh, other um, other command which is uh, j just you know com convert back to notebook and execute everything so i'll have all the outputs and this is quite important to me as well because quite often i start by saying hey just have a look at this view on github github has this nice viewer for jupyter notebooks and uh, that's why I always make sure that the uh, all the notebooks work with the sample data that is being used for it. I actually need to update the sample data as well because it's it's a very old log as well. But yeah, it's there and it's run and it's being viewed. And if you go onto your own computer, you can just run it yourself and also see by yourself that it's all working. It's pretty handy. Um, so yeah, I've mentioned that uh, this is quite a new experience to me. And uh, if I remember, my first experience with the notebook was when I tried to run the um, advanced notebooks to train Depressor uh, before the summit. I started this notebook and left it running for a month. I realized that it was still running because I got a bill from AWS. And uh, yeah, so first lesson was not very pleasant and six months later you know I was I was able to use the same notebook without spending any time in between with it just you know okay I suddenly understood what was happening over there and what was happening when I was following the advanced training notebook uh, so I thought maybe it's quite a steep gap I needed this is a, a steep step to get from nothing to actually use those notebooks it's quite easy though to get started with the console so maybe the log analysis could be pretty much just bridge this uh, learning experience for people to uh, get used to notebooks and uh, towards the end of it be able to use SageMaker uh, for training Depressor in regards to Depressor but then steps further the steps further would be just to use it for whatever they wanted to use it for and uh, because of that I think it should be a learning resource really so there should be more notebooks they should be more detailed and on different levels there should be some more data analysis explanation why things are happening like this or not maybe exposing some code that's currently being held in the utils as well and uh, if we manage to get this done like this maybe we could also add some more things so one of the things i'm hoping for is to get an api uh, th that a aws will share an api for depressa and then we could actually add more things over there like controlling your training and stuff like that it would be also quite an interesting way of getting people used to working with uh, aws and things happening behind the scenes with depressa so yeah uh there's a couple to do's left uh, over there and uh, I still haven't ported the merge requests one of them has been prepared by someone uh, I need to read this I uh, I will find time one day uh, I promise and I will read them and I will merge them and uh, and yeah the tutorial notebooks so at some point uh, I, I would really like to start with a notebook for beginners that would just open up with this nice gr uh, chart that you have also when you watch the console which shows you how your reward is growing and things like that and uh, having this we could also encourage people like uh, Kira Galet from Macedonia uh, he talked at the bootcamp about action space analysis he actually raised a pull request uh, yesterday with his notebook that analyzes that. So uh, I will merge this as well. You'll be able to see what the car's behaviors are. And this could be a base for a nice in-depth uh, action space uh, related notebook. Then maybe we should have something for track analysis like the optimal lines or other things, more details about what's on the track. There's a number of things that we could do over here and uh, yeah, this is something that uh, is, uh, I'm quite excited about the possibilities that it gives. 
and the logs and training and management we've had two guys who actually submitted uh, pretty nice concepts of how to work with your logs uh, what currently happens is uh, you get the simulation ID uh, from uh, the console you put it into the notebook you download the logs or use one of the more general like fetch all methods over there but if you use this you just get the either way you just get the logs and you start analyzing them just like that uh, we had people who actually prepared parsing of uh, other pieces of uh, bits of the logs where you have information what track the car was running on and they would out automatically load this uh, what action space you use what hyperparameters you've got they read all of this information uh, and suddenly you don't need to pretty much provide any information when you start analy analyzing the logs one person went even one step further and they had a template for a notebook so every time you would load a log uh, you would just generate a new notebook that would just analyze this training so really pretty nice stuff happening over there uh, it would be nice to have it in here as well and yeah we're currently just not ready to analyze uh, the new ways of tr of racing the object avoidance or the head-to-head -head training you can do it to some extent but the logs are just missing information about the objects for instance we need to find a way to first gather this information and then put it uh, into the notebook visualize it in some way uh, that that's meaningful especially i'm not really sure at the moment how we would be able to uh, visualize the head-to-head -head racing with uh, all the bot cars on the track we need to find a way i'm sure the community will do it because because why not it's possible I'm sure so we need to just find a way uh, and yeah uh, we should also probably find a way to analyze evaluations during training this one is actually quite tricky you know because there are absolutely no logs from the uh, uh, from those evaluations if you've been training already this season what happens is when the iteration ends and SageMaker starts trading the car carries on going and uh, this is just exploitation of your current model <coughs> the progress average progress from this evaluation is used to determine whether this model was good or not so the, m the more progress on average the car makes the better the model is considered and this one is being used for I'm not sure if cloning but for sure for submissions the best one is being used all the time so if we had those logs and this means that we would need to talk to uh, AWS folks convince them to add them over there and then find a way to just read them properly and use them this could be pretty beneficial especially since many people are just asking whether they could uh, how they can do um, evaluation in local environments uh, yeah it's quite interesting to just uh, see pure um, pure exploitation of your model because when you look at the training uh, events, training episodes, you have this, uh, this entropy over there. So while it gives you a rough idea whether the car is, is no knows what to do, it doesn't give you a guarantee uh, that it's going to happen, uh, that, it, uh, that it's going to behave precisely like that. You might see a really good episode and you think, OK, I'm trained, but it might be just because some uh, actions were altered. And because of that, your car did better than it would, it would do otherwise. So yeah, uh, we would like to have this and hopefully we'll have more ideas because it's a still a fresh project. So maybe we haven't actually exploited all, all explored all the uh, ideas. Uh, if you use the log analysis, uh, I recommend that you join the community Slack. There is a training and log analysis channel over there where you can ask questions and uh, most of the times I will be the one answering them so if you have any problems I hope I will know how I can help you and uh, and yeah there's also one more opportunity why it's worth starting to uh, beginning the race right now uh, one of the community members one of the finalists from 2019 announced a beginners challenge 
uh, in which you can win 1000 AWS uh, $1000 uh, AWS credits uh, if you go to the uh, blog that we're running there the information is at the top of the blog there is a pinned post on how you can get started and there is also one blog post that uh, gives you some suggestions on how you can quickly start training and have a model that you can just uh, put into the race the nice thing about the current uh, way of racing is that you always finish a race it just might take more time but then you just want that's one of the things that you want to improve then so you have more learning and more encouragement it's quite fun although you can not you can fail to finish the race i actually managed to do that recently i think it was after 10 minutes or so my model gave up uh, hitting the box uh, in object avoidance so it's possible to actually not finish a lap but yeah it takes quite some effort um, so yeah, uh, th with this we can take it to some questions and uh, after that I can do a little demo. Uh, do yeah, I'd love to ask a question. Yeah. Um, I, I think I was actually on your website a couple of weeks back looking at this stuff and the one thing that I was really confused about with the log analysis is what I really wanted to see was a log of what the values were of the input parameters at each step. Like, what was the waypoint value that I was at? What was my distance from center? What was the value is is left of tra of center was it true or was it false mm -hmm. are those parameter values available in the logs um the logs don't have those values as such there are two ways to get them one of them is uh, by just doing a print in your reward function and then you can download it from the cloud watch and uh, the logs will contain a a dictionary or a JSON with this information for you. Another one of them is one of the tools which is quite confusing and I really don't know how to uh, ex how to describe it better in a convenient in a clear way. Uh, it's new reward. So when I ran out of my initial budget I had to find a way to train more efficiently and to do that uh, I thought what if I could just, yeah, what you said, just get those values and maybe replay it on a different reward function. Uh, at first I thought maybe I could use that, uh, those prints from trainings, but not all of my trainings had prints with all this information in there. And then I realized that pretty much what's in the logs is sufficient to, um, to just uh, calculate them. So the new reward functionality that's in the in the notebook, at least for the time trial races, it gives you all the information needed to actually regenerate the params argument for your reward function. And then you can use a different reward function and kind of replay the experiences gathered from the previous training to see if your reward would align differently, if you would reward better behaviors than previously there's some loss of precision over there and some of the parameters i was too lazy because I, to, to implement because I, a they felt difficult and b i did not use them but uh, some of them most of them are available this way do you have an example of the first thing you said of printing the reward printing like i guess adding some print code in your reward function to push the param values to cloudwatch it's you have an example? It's literally just write print uh, params and it lands in your CloudWatch, just like that. In your reward function, just do print params and that's it. As easy as that. Yeah, put, uh, put the one liner in the chat for everyone. Yeah, yeah. And what is it? It'll just give you one line for each step? Yes, exactly. So you will have uh, the, uh, if we go back to the slide 
that has the logs um, this guy so in cloud what you what you will see will be these lines and uh, in between them there will be a dictionary print uh, printed from python code so is it only showing a subset because those are the only ones you uh you made use of in your reward function um, by subset what do you mean sorry like i don't think that you have about 10 or 15 oh, per you mean, line oh you mean this print in this line that, that it's a subset i'm not sure why the developers decided to use only a subset over here but this uh, this is sufficient to regenerate all of them So what's happening is, well, sufficient as in if you provide information about the track, the waypoints of the track, then it's sufficient to do this. But yeah, I've been doing it in the past. I've made, found a way how to do this and, uh, and yeah, you can just re recreate them and use them. I haven't really spent any time on putting them in a data frame, but maybe it would make sense I didn't really need it because I I very seldom look at uh, rewards step by step. Uh, once I found all the more teething problems with my uh, reward functions, I didn't have the need to look at it step by step, so I didn't regenerate it. But yeah, it could be quite interesting thing to also add if you if you find value in it. Okay, but is like that second number is that the step value like it's step 13 then step 14 yes exactly so this is the episode step uh, x coordinates y coordinates then uh, this is the uh, angle well the heading angle then we've got the three over here are the action decision so this is the speed perhaps no, this is the angle, then there's the speed, and then there's the action ID. So, you know, the action space is just a JSON, which has the steering, speed, and yeah. index value. So these are those three. Then this one is the reward function. Uh, these two, I don't remember right now. I think one of them is all wheels on track. The other one is uh, either whether it's done or I think I think first one is if the lap is complete and the other one is no sorry I'm conf I don't remember what the first one shows but uh, they are always on track and something else I don't remember now and then there's progress uh, after progress there is uh, I don't remember what this number is at the moment then there's the length of the track and uh, the time stamp and whether the training is in progress or not uh so yeah uh, oh yeah i know this one is the closest waypoint if you go to the deep racer utils project in the um log I don't know, log utils file over the script there is a big comment explaining what each field means and uh that this is the way that pretty much it's in the method that just converts uh from uh, the CSV format to uh, Pandas data frame. So you will have all of those fields explained over there. Cool, thank you. Thomas, I have a question about the pull requests that you got last year. Um, do you know where I can find them? Because I looked at the new repo and it looks like the ones you mentioned are only there, like the ones from Kire. Yeah, so there is another, there is a fork of the uh, AWS Depressor Workshops repository within the Depressor community space, and all of the pull requests are in the. Got it. Thank you. Right, so do we have any other questions or would you like to see the notebook in action? 
I guess we can go over to the notebook. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment to just switch over to a different window. Yeah, so by now you should be able to see uh, the Jupyter notebook. Okay, so yeah, this is the uh, this is the um, track analysis notebook uh, that we. Pr I, one of the first things that I've done really was splitting the original notebook into two because it felt confusing that there was training and evaluation analysis in one place. I've also added some more uh, description. Initially, hardly anything was described right now. I think it feels that there's just too much over here. So that's that's one of the reasons why I would like to simplify those notebooks and split them into smaller ones. But yeah, it pretty much helps you. It gives you the uh, description on uh, how to get started, how to configure everything. And uh, and yeah, you can just load the uh, dependencies. You can see that there are the depressor utils things over here. So there are the tracks uh, utils and the logs utils. And uh, yeah, you can get and just check what the tracks what tracks are available and have a look at how what they look like. So. Uh, right now I'm training using the uh, most recent uh, track. I never remember the name, sorry. But yeah, uh, one of the things that's been added right now is a bit bigger view of it with the waypoints. Right now it's not readable. I actually have a change pending to release that will just let you show every nth waypoint as a number. So it's much more readable. And uh, and yeah, I've already loaded the logs that I uh, trained on today uh, from today's training. And uh, what's happening uh, normally when I work with the notebook, the first thing I do is I remove all the description and merge some of the code cells just to have some faster runs because usually I just check the same things over and over again. So if we load the logs, uh, you can see that the logs uh, in the local training, if you train for long enough, uh, the old log gets a dot number and the new one is created with the same name. So the code just loads both of them. There's a number of ways to actually load the files and find them. So you can see that there's a way for the, <coughs> for the console and for different repositories that you use. There should be more probably or or we should focus on some way to have one way to download from anywhere to make it also much simpler. Uh, and yeah, uh, so when I, when I mentioned the new reward functionality, uh, when I write a reward function, I wrap it around uh, with a class, just like here in the code. So my reward function goes in here, and this way I have some state that I can have. I can detect when I'm starting a new uh, a new it uh, episode, and then I just instantiate the object, and my reward function is declared like this. It works in the local training. It works for the log analysis. It works in the console. Pretty handy for me. Uh, I know there is a bit of boilerplate code, but I kind of I come from Java. I'm used to boiler boilerplate. Uh, and yeah, uh, then you get the chance to actually visualize things. There's a description of uh, what's, what you've got in those uh, in these graphs over here. But uh, if I load it, it will take a while. Actually, I'm just gonna load more of them and then we're gonna go back. Um, right, so this is the one I usually look at the most because I care about certain things uh, over here. Not so much about the reward, but I like to see it grow because this means that there's still uh, some improvement and some potential if the reward function is correct. If it's not correct, then you're training more and more towards suboptimal behavior. You need to take that into account as well. Then uh, the times uh, per iteration, it's not really that, uh, that useful uh, when you don't have a lot of completed laps because the more the more of the laps you complete, the times will be higher. That's the rule, right? If you just do 10% every time, you will have awesome times, but no completion. But then I look at the progress 
per iteration and the reason for that is because uh, quite often I'm stuck somewhere and the moment I see it go up it seems it feel it, it suggests that something's happening that's better but this one goes usually in pair with the completion rate so this one is showing how many uh, episodes within the iteration are being completed with zero being none and one being all of them in this uh, training I actually have uh, 60 episodes per iteration so uh, the 0 0.2 means that there are 12 complete laps in given iteration and yeah the times are also quite important over here so this time these times actually have one problem which is uh, resources so local training uh, is a bit more resource hungry hungry this year because of that it's rather slow and uh, the steps are happening not so often they should be happening the, the, each step and decision should be happening 15 times a second right now in my training it's happening roughly five times a second uh, so yeah there is a big difference uh, in there but also because the real-time factor in simulation is different from uh, one which would mean that times flows as quickly as in the reality these times will be higher because uh, we are measuring them by system clock not by the simulation clock uh, but when I submit it it should go faster so um, models like this in object avoidance uh, times like this should give me if I don't get any collisions obviously should give me under one under one minute uh, which I'm currently have so yeah kind of works and then uh, right now I pretty much skip over those uh, graphs they showed some dependency between time progress steps rewards these are not that important and right now I had something that go got wrong I think what's happening sometimes is uh, when I hit the box in the uh, in the ob object avoidance training it moves from its side and doesn't go back when I start another episode and the car can just drive into it and get stuck and stays like this for a long time so this is uh, this dot and because of that all of this is just squashed uh, into some unreasonable level but it you can still see a bit roughly triangular shape over here and usually that's what I'm looking for in my uh, reward to time dependency a uh, triangular shape which usually means that if I have well, you know, I usually should have higher reward for higher progress, but then within my complete laps, I want to have a higher reward for faster uh, lap. So uh, they s and uh, sometimes I might want, for instance, a 90% complete lap to have higher reward than a complete one because uh, the 90% one was more promising in terms of behavior. So there's a number of things and the triangular shape gives me pretty much that, that uh, if you just look at the top over here, below I have the same set of graphs, but just for the um, complete laps, this is, this, this is uh, this side of this triangle. So you can see that faster laps give higher reward and uh, get higher reward and slower ones lower reward which I can usually see that when I start lapping I have times around uh, uh, slightly higher and then they s the, the average mildly drifts to the left and then usually stays there and I just get things all over, all over the place afterwards and uh, and yeah, this is also the uh, mm, the thing that I like looking at. Uh, if you imagine all the episodes, well, not imagine. Let's say we got a hundred episodes. So what this group of uh, stats gave me is they are being divided into like buckets or groups. So one to twenty, twenty-one to forty, forty-one to sixty, and so on. So there's five of them right now. And 
each of them shows the same stats so we've got the rewards you can see if the reward is growing like this one had really nice outcome over here and this one had this unlucky guy over here that just made everything unreadable uh, but also you can see what's happening with the progress with time so with my training right now you can see that uh, around 30 percent of progress i finished quite a lot of my episodes if we just go up for a moment to this thing 30 percent is roughly here if i remember properly so this is where i usually fail and i have problems with getting around the track somewhere over here so what I'm looking for in these graphs is for this thing to go down and you can see it's close to 400 then above 300 over here then under 300 then over 250 and I want to have more complete laps but not too many so you can see this grow but uh, I don't want to have too many complete laps just because um, if I have many of them, it might be that I've already overfitted. It doesn't guarantee me that I didn't uh, overfit my model if I uh, don't have a lot of complete laps. But still, uh, having more failures give, uh, gives me this hope that if I need to change something substantial in my training, then I can just uh, I can just do this and hope that I will actually get better with time. There's, a, there's an opportunity for improving a model and uh, if you overfit it's really difficult to train away from certain behaviors so yeah and uh, one thing that I started looking at uh, yeah, it still has all the old outputs you can look at uh, more details like what happened around the track when you trained and then these are like um, better, best rewarded laps in the training so I can have a look uh, and see some wobbliness. Uh, maybe I will have one thing. Yeah, oh, this is something that I wanted to show you, for instance. So I've mentioned that we've got uh, fewer steps per second. And what I've noticed is the faster the car went, after getting past the chicane, it would zigzag over here. You can see that it's doing less and less turning left and right. And what I think is happening over here is like, it decides to turn over here but it's already slightly too late so it overcompensates and the moment it should straighten out to go over here it turns too much and the action decision comes over here so it turns the other way and you can see this zigzag over here it just the decisions come too late so even though the car adjusts it's happen it's doing too much of the desired action and doesn't turn away from it uh, hopefully this will get resolved soon and uh, I usually also look at this graph that shows the heat map of rewards, which is if I'm rewarding the right things and ri pretty much right placement on the track. It takes some time to generate, but uh, usually I can see some patterns. At the beginning, the dots are all over the place or it's pretty much just black because there is one high reward and everything else is really low so you can't see anything in the in this uh, visualization but uh, yeah so it, while it's gonna run I'm just gonna go over to another one that got in fixed over here I need to re organize those uh, charts and graphs but yeah the action breakdown so this is one of the things that was uh, shown in the initial notebook but it never worked for other training than uh, the sample notebook uh, there were a few reasons for that one of them was that it was assuming that there were always five or six actions happening you had to uh, set the actions manually to actually visualize everything uh, I managed to uh, generate actions descriptions so now as many actions you've got you will have a chart for each and you don't need to supply them oh yeah i i shouldn't have given the action breakdown this will not make it make any sense but so yeah i'm just going to remove this thing the track breakdown is just uh, you saw the these red areas over here it just highlights certain pieces and describes the track that's like all like metadata for the track so I'm just going to rerun this and hopefully we will be able to see the no it's still running anyway 
it might be a bit long and we might not get it uh, here maybe it will just pop up in a bit so yeah i sometimes look at the action breakdown uh, more uh, out of curiosity because it shows pretty nice uh, nicely when the car decides to turn left where it takes where it compensates and things like that so i like to look at it uh, but also i've noticed that uh, i need to remove the starting steps from it because otherwise i will always have the same dots around the track for each training each episode okay so here we go it's loaded uh, you can see roughly where i reward the car to go uh, with a high reward where it, when it goes over there and uh, yeah so pretty much using this i was uh, using this i can see if i'm actually putting the right rewards or maybe uh, there are places like let's say over here i'm not sure what's happening in my reward function this is something that i need to analyze uh, why i got uh, brighter dots over here brighter dots mean higher reward and uh, just out of the blue i just have a section over here i don't know why i need to find out this and one thing that i've realized today is you can see over here that i have high reward quite close to this turn but what I've noticed in my submissions right now is that the car keeps going off track over here all the time. Uh, so even though right now I'm, let's say, at roughly 10-11% completion rate uh, in the training, which gives me uh, quite a lot of confidence in my model, I'm just not able to complete three laps without going off track over here. And if I go off track over here, I just keep smashing to a box that's just right after that. And this means that uh, suddenly my lap turns into like five, six minutes because I can just stare for one minute at the car just hitting the box until it actually pushes it out of the track and then it goes around nicely again because the box is no longer there. So yeah, that's something that I need to improve and if I do then maybe I'll actually hold on to my place this month. Uh, yeah, so I think that's all that I wanted to show. Let's see if the actions got generated yeah it got generated but just for one uh, episode so yeah this is something that i've also started improving in uh, in my on my dev box i don't have this change uh, released yet you'll be able to see action breakdown for more than one uh, episode or uh, iteration which is quite nice um okay so i'm just going to stop sharing now and uh, yeah, I took a bit more time than planned. Sorry about that, but yeah. Do you have any other questions, or maybe you would like to have a look at how to set up the training, the log analysis? If you want to, I can help you out with that as well. Yeah, Thomas, I had a question. So you mentioned you had action spaces, right? Like hairpin and then left, right? and maybe extreme left, extreme right. Uh, is that consistent across all tracks or for maybe some tracks you would name it differently? Like maybe there's an intermediate left, intermediate right. So how flexible is your code to handle that? For the action breakdown, it says it's left and the number of degrees and right number of degrees. So it will work with parallel, with uh, uh, symmetrical and asymmetrical action space. It will just work with and everything cool thank you uh, right do we have any other questions or okay i guess not so just to wrap up uh let's uh I invite you to do the uh, to join the challenge that Juve has prepared, the beginners challenge. Uh, again, it's blog.deepracing.io, uh, where you can see the details of it. And uh, if you need any help, just join the community, and we'll be happy to help because uh, we pretty much just threw in the competition for AWS and changed it from competition to competition, where suddenly the more you help the better results you get so so we're helping a lot and uh yeah that's all thank you very much thank you very much thomas oh thanks very very much very very good 
Uh, so I just have some closing remarks. I'll just share my screen quickly and then I'll let you guys get back. Uh, so the next steps, in case uh, you didn't hear earlier in the call, um, most of the summits have been canceled till mid-summer. It is still July, I think. So even the New York summit is canceled and they replaced it with this AWS online summit that's happening on May 13th. So please feel free to register. I'm not sure if they'll have a virtual circuit. They might. Uh, I haven't heard definitively on that. Do you know any information, Thomas? If they'll have a... So the DeepRacer teams are still working out on how they can compensate for lack of the uh, physical summit races. Because the reality is there are 96 places to fill, most of them from the summits. Yeah. So yeah, that's the, uh, the, the intention that I had is they need to find an alternative way to get people to qualify into the finals. Uh, so yeah, but I don't have any details to share on this at the moment. Hopefully we'll get them soon. Sure. So yeah, I would highly encourage you to participate in the online summit. Who knows, maybe they'll have a bunch of us qualify or something like that. Uh, the next thing I want to highlight is, so we have a, our own community virtual race. Uh, and I shared this link in the, um, in, the meet in the meetup group. Actually, maybe I'll do it right now. Hang on. Um, so I'll just share this in the meetup group. And the winner of this race will win $25 um, credits. So community virtual race. So that's the link. So please feel free to join it. And yeah, good luck. Um, the contest ends on Sunday night. So you have until then to train an awesome model. And it uses the 2019 Deep Racer Championship Cup track, which is used in all the physical summits. Uh, and also the next event I'm going to tell you, which I think Thomas already highlighted, is this AWS Deep Racer Community Beginners Race. Uh, so Thomas mentioned that the winner will get $1,000 AWS credits, but even the top 50 spots get some form of credits. So you don't have to be the winner, but you can still uh, get some serious credits just by ending up at the top 50. Then the last thing is join the online community. So it's uh, you can either go through deepracing.io or you can go through AWS ML community slack.com. So that's it from me. Um, the next meetup will be probably on May 19th. I'll put that up in a meetup group. It'll be our deep lens. Uh, so if you, I'll send you guys obviously a, a message on meetup and ask you for feedback on what you would like to hear, but, uh, any final thoughts or anything, um, Cool. All right. Thank you very much, Thomas. And uh, everyone have a good evening. Yeah. Thanks very much, Thomas. Thanks. Very Is much. it like, like, like 12 o'clock there? Uh, in, yeah, in it's 20 past 12 and I have oh my, my alarm goodness. clock at 5.30. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much for staying up. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I, I enjoy talking to people from the communities around the world. I had, uh, I had another uh, meetup uh on saturday in peru so i'm seeing the world i'm going to places right now <laughs> uh, virtual trips right? exactly <laughs>